afternoon. Uh, whoever will save his life shall lose it. Um, and that's uh, a saying of Jesus which is recorded in all three of the Synoptic Gospels and which appears on more than one occasion. Uh, something like it was said uh, three times. Something, some, some of them are only recorded in one gospel. Sometimes it's all three of them. Um, the, the main reference, I think, is in Matthew 16. So if we go to Matthew 16 and verse 25, this is where we first, uh, well, it's not where we first read it. Jesus had already said this, but I think this is one of the more explanatory passages about it. So Matthew 16 and verse 25, uh, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whoever shall lose his life for my sake shall save it. So what, what, you can think of that, um, well, the context, let's, let's think of that. The context is that Jesus has taken the disciples away from, from Galilee uh, he's got away from the, the, the big crowds that gathered when Jesus, almost when he went into a city in Galilee, says Mark, couldn't go in, in in public because if he went through the gates, a crowd gathered immediately and people came in from the surrounding countryside to heal, uh, to be healed or to have, bring people who are going to be healed or to, um, to hear him speak. Um, so we've gone away to the, the area of around Caesarea Philippi. That was a much more Gentile area. Jesus wasn't so well known there, so he could get away from the big crowds. And he is then preparing for a, a change in direction in his ministry uh, by asking the disciples what men think of him. So if you go uh, to verse 13 of Matthew 16... This is the beginning of it. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Uh, so he's asked, Who do people think I am? He's been, been teaching for some years. People have heard him speak. They've seen him do miracles. They've been healed by him. So what do they think he is? And, he gets a, a, a variety of responses. I think that's probably the best description. All of them wrong. Uh, and that's in, in verse 14. So he gets some say that, that you're John the Baptist, uh, others um, Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And of course, Jesus wasn't any of those. Uh, they were all completely wrong. Um, so having, I suppose, shown that to the disciples by asking or underlined it, he then, in, in verse 15, says unto them, But who say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Peter's voicing the understanding of the disciples, and they have understood that Jesus is, is the Christ, the Messiah, the coming King. Uh, and in, in Mark and in Luke, the phrase, the son of the living God's omitted. Clearly, it's the fact that Jesus is the Messiah that's the most important. But that Jesus, the son of God, is included in there as well. I'll come back to that in a moment. Verse 17, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also to thee that thou art Peter, and on this rock, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Jesus has endorsed Peter's answer. He says it's right. Jesus has said he is the Christ. He is the son of God. Um, and he goes on to indicate that that statement is the foundation of Christianity. Now that, that's a uh, last verse, verse 18. is one that's been misunderstood, uh, uh, even warped to provide a, a, an excuse to enforce the authority of the church, um, even over the message of Jesus and the apostles. 
but that's not what it means. Uh, Peter, the word the name Peter, Petros means a stone, thing you can pick up, large pebble if you like. Um, the word rock there is Petra, different word slightly, and that talking about bedrock, stuff you built foundations on. And what's happening here is that um, Peter is um, being, it's called a stone, but it's the rock of the thing that Peter has said, the bedrock, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, on which the ecclesia is being built. That The words for rock and Peter sound a bit similar. The word, it's rather similar, you've got the marginal, it's got an ESV, you read the marginal comment, it says, the words for rock and stone sound similar in the original Greek, and that's about as close as it gets. It doesn't say the, uh, that's about as close as it gets, but it's a nice comment. Um, they're not the same word, though. So uh, we've got the, the e Ecclesia, the Church of Christ Jesus, founded on the statement that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's a statement with very strong Old Testament connotations. So if you'd like to, um, we're going to come back in the end to Matthew 16. We're going to go to Psalms and Isaiah first. Let's go to Psalm 2, first of all. Uh, and see, you've got an echo of Psalm 2 in, in this statement uh, of Peter. So Psalm 2 and the first verse. Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth and themselves set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us so we've got there this word anointed and that's a translation of a Hebrew word and the Hebrew word is Messiah it's a word that we're often familiar with because it's got the oratorio uh, by Handel called after it uh, if that we translated that word into Greek instead we would have got Christos Christ so he's saying uh, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord that's God and against his Christ saying so when Peter says you are the Christ he's talking about this person who is called out to rule the nations here in Psalm 2. Uh, so it's Christ in English, really, it's the same word. And the status of the Messiah is indicated a little bit further down the psalm. Here we've now got the, the Messiah, it being a, being a poem, we've got the Messiah speaking, what the Messiah might say uh, in the future when God does rule the kingdoms of the world. Verse 7, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said to me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Again, you've got authorised version, English translation. The heathen, it's talking about the nations. It's the nations that don't serve God. Uh, we've given that different connotations nowadays. But he's really talking about all the nations that don't serve God are going to be brought under the control of uh, the Lord's anointed, the Messiah, uh, the ruling king. So this is a, 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 a picture of a very powerful character, someone who is going to rule the earth under God, someone who can legitimately be called the Son of God, not just a Son of God, but the Son of God. And uh, Peter has reminded us that Jesus is this person. Um, so notice, didn't, you didn't notice in verse 7, that this Messiah is called the Son of God. And what's happening is that this, this psalm, and there are other psalms which say the same thing, it's talking about a, a period where this ruler begins to rule and in Psalm 2 the nations are not liking the idea very well 
and they are rising up against God and rising up against uh, the Messiah but that's a fairly pointless thing it talks about well um, verse 4 he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh the Lord shall have them in derision then he shall speak unto them and uh, in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion so rebelling against God is a bit of a, a pointless exercise it isn't going to get you very far you might even uh, bring more trouble on you than you already have and in the end uh, the nations have to submit to the will of God and what is ushered in then is a kingdom of peace and of prosperity and of calm uh, and there are pictures again of that throughout the, the Bible but I, I'm just going to pick one so we can have a quick look at what it, it's described as being like and that's in Isaiah 11 Isaiah 11 verse 1 and to just read a passage there uh, which describes what this time is to be like uh, incidentally in, in verse 1 of Isaiah 11 it, it talks about Jesus uh, having been descended from Jesse, uh, descended one of the ancestors of David the king, also an ancestor of Jesus. So let's read it. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And shall and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt or destroy all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea and it's talking about a, a period much different from the troubles that we have at the moment you know, at a time in the future when God rules on the earth um, and everything is put to right more than we can even imagine really uh, it has to get very poetical to talk about it because it, it, it simply uh, if it took if it described it in detail, it would take forever. Um, now, going back to the gospel account, Peter has just voiced the idea that this Messiah is Jesus, or Jesus is this Messiah, the coming king, and Jesus has confirmed that this understanding is correct. So the first, the first target, as it were, of Jesus' mission has been met, he has explained who he is to his disciples. And that actually takes more than half of the time between his baptism and his crucifixion. Um, anyway, let's go back to verse 21 because he now has to explain what's going to happen next. So Matthew 16 and verse 21. Um, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day um, the ultimate point of Jesus ministry was that he was going to be crucified dead and buried and then to rise from the dead the first day of the week and by doing this he was to provide a route for the forgiveness of the sins and the rebellions of mankind against God the disciples would see his death or at least some of them would 
Some of them were, were in hiding by that point, but uh, Peter at least was, was there to see it, and so was John. And they would be witnesses to his resurrection, all of them. And they would then need to take the news of the death and the resurrection of Jesus and, and his coming kingdom together with the whole kingdom of God and take that out into the world and explain that to people from Jewish background, people from Gentile backgrounds. All sorts of people would have to learn about that. And Jesus is making sure they understand it beforehand. They didn't very much. They had problems understanding that Jesus was going to die and be raised until they saw it happen. But when he was raised, they understood what he'd been talking about. And that's the point of the saying. This idea that they would have to go out and take uh, the message out is the point of the, the, the saying we're investigating. The problem for a disciple was, and, and still is for that matter, that the teaching of the kingdom of God is unpopular, uh, particularly among those in power or those with political ambition or the supporters of those people. They don't like to think that the best they can do is pretty temporary and the best they can do is, is not going to be as good as what could be done by God without them. And so the people who carry the message of the kingdom of God take a risk. Sometimes it's only, only a risk of being considered odd. Sometimes uh, it's, a, it's a threat to career or to livelihood. Sometimes it's a threat to life. Uh, I know people who've suffered all those things as a consequence of the teaching the kingdom of God. And that's the point of the saying that we're, we're looking at. We go to... Matthew 16 and verse 24. Um, then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And what he's saying is that if we're going to follow him, then we have to take up the burden of, of persecution or, or of ridicule or of being discriminated against and follow Jesus anyway. And the passage then continues with an analysis of the costs and the benefits of becoming a follower of Jesus. Verse 26, uh, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world? and lose his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul that word soul there by the way is the same word as life in, in um, verse 25 in, in, in Greek is that the same word um, anyway that's, that's the first part of the analysis it's the, 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 the point of integrity if you conceal your knowledge of Jesus and the gospel that he proclaimed then you're living a lie not only that, but in, in the judgment, you've lost eternal life. Supposing that you abandon the gospel of Jesus Christ, you might, you might become more popular, you might rise in society, you might be promoted in your job, you might reach political power, you might gain wealth. But if you do, you will have lost your own soul. You've lost your integrity now and your claim to eternal life later on. On a simple calculation of profit and loss, there's no benefit in failing to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 27. Um, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. And so it's the final point of the passage, the return of Jesus Christ. At some point in the future, Jesus is to return and set up the kingdom of God and that part of faithfulness or faithfulness, faithlessness for that matter will, uh, it will be revealed and it will become very important now let's look at a, a parallel account the same sayings they appear in Luke's gospel in chapter 9 and verse 23 and it, it adds another couple of points there so Luke 9 and verse 23 
said to them all, <clears throat> If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And the, uh, the word daily is the additional word in Luke that doesn't appear elsewhere. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> if you take up your cross, it's not something you do once and then forget. It's something that you have to carry on doing day by day. That's what's being said here. <coughs> There's a further part of Jesus' words that's recorded which tells us that we could fail to take up our cross uh, in verse 26 in, here in Luke for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words of him shall the son of man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels so when Jesus returns in glory the angels with him on the day of judgment those who are, have been ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ will be ashamed of them. The implication is that he's not going to be associated with them at the day of judgment. So uh, it's not simply a matter of um, proclaiming Jesus within, um, within the, uh, the, the faithful. It's talking about our determination to proclaim Jesus and that's one of the determinants of the outcome on the, the day of judgment. Have we proclaimed Christ Jesus or not? And uh, it's a matter of proclaiming the gospel in, the, in a way that's risky to us, something which could cause us to, to um, suffer problems uh, outside, which could get us in the position of the cross, um, something uh, that is emphasized here in the Gospels. Well, let's look at a, a, another uh, occurrence of the same saying, this time in Matthew's Gospel again. We were looking in, in chapter 13. Let's look in chapter 10 now in verse uh, 32. So it's a little bit earlier in Jesus' ministry. Matthew 10. verse 32 starts off whosoever therefore shall confess me before men him will I confess also before my father which is in heaven but whosoever shall deny me before men him will I also deny before my father which is in heaven and so it's something that he said again next time he said the same uh, thing in the Luke account, there it is. Here it is in Matthew, but on a different occasion. But it's a very clear passage. It's the, the duty of every follower of Jesus to confess Christ. Our faith has to be something we live, something we speak up for, something that becomes obvious to those around us. Not to do that is to deny Christ, and to do this is to, to deny Christ, that is, is to, is to forfeit our relationship with Christ Jesus. Now the context of that passage is of interest. It's early on in the ministry of Jesus as he sends out his 12 disciples to proclaim the kingdom of God. He begins by giving specific instructions, but those then change into an expectation of opposition. Uh, some people are expected to, to close their, their ears and refuse to listen. Others are going to speak evil of one. Uh, verse 25, for example, he said, it's uh, enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord, if they have called the master of the house be Elzebub, how much more shall they call them within his household? Um, so the, 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 uh, the reaction of, of those who hear this speaking are not necessarily the best uh, response one would hope for. They're saying, you're mad, you've got a devil, uh, when you start saying it. Uh, and in fact it gets worse it gets to physical abuse and to arrest and persecution verse, uh, verse 16 of, of, uh, of the chapter um, behold I send you forth as a sheep in the midst of wolves 
Be ye there as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up into the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and against the Gentiles. So he's not just talking about the next month or two while the disciples were doing a trip around Galilee. He's talking about something which is going on uh, out afterwards in, into the world. Uh, and we're fortunate that things aren't as bad as this in Britain at the moment. There are parts of the world where proclaiming Christ might mean death. Fortunately, not in Britain at the moment. Um, but one might expect that the proclamation of the gospel will mean uh, opposition and conflict. Matthew 10 and verse uh, 34. Think not that I am come to bring sent peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a, a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. And that is the outcome, or possible outcome, of proclaiming the gospel. Um, those who reject the gospel will often do so emphatically and use all sorts of pressure against those who proclaim it. While the kingdom of God will bring peace, in the meantime, one might expect to find violent and unpleasant reactions from even one's own family. That's what it's saying. Uh, sometimes you find people who, who pick that out and say, oh, that contrasts with the kingdom of God, the peace of the kingdom of God, and it does. But they're talking about two different times. This is talking about the time before the kingdom of God, where teaching the kingdom of God, where telling people how to reach the kingdom of God is likely to be opposed by others around. In Britain, it's down to just ridicule. If you try it in Iran, it gets a bit more difficult. Anyway, the next couple of verses then are, are something, bring something familiar. Verse 38. He says, and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. But, and he that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. And we've got the, the saying that Jesus repeated uh, a few chapters later that we looked at before. Now it's possible, I suppose, that these words aren't in chronological sequence. It's a common literary device in Jewish writings to arrange materials by subject rather than by chronology and there are other places where Matthew does that so Matthew doesn't use that device but um, probably he did actually say it at this point it probably fits in nicely into the way that into the what he's saying to the disciples here um, it might have been a, <clears throat> a bit difficult for the disciples to make sense of the reference to a cross that early in Jesus ministry he only knows about they only start talking about the crucifixion chapter 16 and thereafter <clears throat> but the the message that the passage before does show the context of that saying it's very clear about proclaiming the gospel of Christ Jesus doing that won't make us respectable it won't make us popular we might be ridiculed we might be criticized we might lose social standing we might even lose more than that but our duty is to proclaim the gospel so let's go on now to look at the third occasion on which Jesus uses the expression we're looking at. And this time, the occasion is recorded only in the Gospel of Luke. It's Luke chapter 17 and verse 26. So Luke 17, verse 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. And he's talking about events just before the return of Jesus. That's what he means by the days of the Son of Man. Verse 30 refers to the same period, even this shall, so this shall be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Um, the, the same time. Now... As he's saying, well, it would be like as it was in the days of Noah. And we also get a picture of uh, the days of Lot, which is a little bit easier to understand, so look at that one first. Uh, 
Luke 17, verse 28. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So Sodom was a city which appears in the book of Genesis in the Bible uh, at the time of Abraham, around 2000 BC. Uh, it had existed before then, but around 2000 BC, Abraham is on the hills above it. Uh, at that time, it's noted for all kinds of immorality and sexual license, especially note for rampant homosexuality. And because of the depravity of that city, which was depraved in, in many, many different ways, uh, God decided to destroy it. But there was a righteous family uh, in the city, relatives of Abraham, the family of Lot, some of whom had not been corrupted by the city. And God sent two angels to destroy Sodom. One of them stays to carry out the destruction. The other leads Lot and his wife and his two daughters away from the city to safety. But Lot's wife turned back, uh, and the text tells us she became a pillar of salt. Presumably she was overwhelmed by the, the debris of the destruction. Uh, and that's the warning of the passage here, verse 31. Um, in, the, in that day which uh, he, shall, he that shall be on the housetops and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. So turning back to the old life, rather than escaping uh, to safety, destroyed Lot's wife. And that's the warning of the return of Jesus, not to turn back to one's old life and one's possessions in the world without God. And then we've got the saying that we're thinking about in verse 33. Um, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Uh, and this time the passage is applied to the last days. But it's quite likely that the meaning is similar to that of the meaning in the other two uh, occurrences. Uh, that would fit nicely with the context. It would fit the main point of the account. Uh, if this is a correct interpretation, then it refers to attempting to preserve one's life outside Christ and looking back to preserve that rather than, than seeking uh, to proclaim the kingdom of God. Look at the context. Verse 32, remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife turned back to the comfort of Sodom rather than escape the destruction that was coming. Verse 28, let's just read that out. Uh, Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they builded. Um, Sodom was noted for depravity, but it isn't the depravity that's mentioned here. What's mentioned here is the ordinary things of life, things that we do without thinking about. We, we, you know, we, we, we buy and sell. We, we've, we've all eaten fairly recently, lunchtime. Uh, we, all, we all drink. Uh, we buy things. If we're in the right line of business, we sell things. We plant. We build. None of us would see anything wrong in those. Marry and give him marriage. There'd be marriages in this very room. Uh, and we aren't ashamed of them. Uh, but those are the things of a life outside the gospel. So they're not, they're not um, blameless in themselves. They're not, sorry, guilty in themselves. Nothing wrong with them in themselves. But if that's all you do, if that's where you're... Uh, your thinking is we concentrate entirely on the, the uh, eating, the drinking, the marrying and the giving in marriage Then, and we're not thinking about God the missing item there Then, and we're not proclaiming the kingdom of God then uh, we're in there with the people of Sodom that's what it's saying or it says back into verse 26 for Noah as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be also in the days of the son of man 
They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. And they were so uh, full of the ordinary things of life. And again, Noah's time was, was days it says, were full of violence. That's a bad thing. But it doesn't mention that here in, in Luke. And while one can expect both the bad things of Sodom, the sort of permissive society, I think, using a very old-fashioned word to talk about it, or the things of Noah, the violence, you can expect those in the last days. That's a sign. Nevertheless, the exhortation is the people who were engaging themselves in the ordinary things of life to the point where they didn't think about God anymore. And uh, therefore, they didn't pay attention to the flood. They were so busy in buying and selling and eating and drinking and giving, marrying and giving in marriage that when the, uh, the ark there couldn't miss it, sang aside for an ocean liner in the middle of dry land, and suddenly the ark was shut up and it began to rain and the water started to rise, they suddenly realized that maybe they hadn't been going down the right direction. It's too late. And that's the warning, is that we don't want to be like that ourselves. Now, um, there might be a need to flee the destruction of cities or of houses or work or business without waiting things together. That might be part of it. He's talking about people not going back to retrieve things. But uh, it's very clear that dedication to the gospel is a prerequisite for salvation. That's what that passage is really about. The world we live in is every bit as rotten as the worlds of Noah or of Sodom. And yet we often try quite hard not to stand out and be different. But our society, uh, or in our society, respectability is the same as worldliness. Uh, to be part of it, to save our lifestyle, is to lose our eternal life. And to lose our life in this world is to gain it in the world to come. And that's what is the meaning of the words. Whoever will save his life shall lose it. Music